you might have an initial idea, uh, but you have to really feel out the market and, and see what is best for your customer and then make adjustments from there. Business of Architecture, episode 246. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects and designers, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, head over to freearchitectgift.com to get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map video. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. The all-in-one firm management software core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. On today's show, we speak with Connor Gillivan. Connor is the founder of a company called FreeUp that connects business owners with vetted, skilled freelancers. Hey, Connor, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thanks for having me on today. So, Connor, I was hoping we could hop into a little bit of your background as an op- entrepreneur. Usually, we feature people who are directly involved in the design industry on sure. the podcast. But your your background intrigued me, and I thought we'd have you on here because I believe that there's a lot of lessons that can be shared from other industries that are very applicable to architecture. Awesome. Yeah. So, I really started my entrepreneurial journey while I was still in college. I, I met my business partner while we were sophomores in college, and he was starting to sell textbooks through Amazon.com. This was around 2009 as the Amazon marketplace was really starting to blow up and become a a big site where everyone was shopping from. And so we were there at a great time. We sold textbooks for about a year. And then we wanted to try to find a way where we weren't actually handling the products because we we found it a lot of work to, you know, store them in our, our house, our dorm room, put them into a box, bring them to UPS, ship it to the right customer. There was a lot of operations there that we didn't love handling. And so we started working with suppliers and brands around the United States that would allow us to drop ship their products. And so drop shipping is where a brand, so, you know, let's say Nike is a brand. They make their own shoes. They give us permission to market and sell their product through Amazon. And as we receive sales, we send the order to them. They ship it to the customer and then we'll handle any customer service. So we built that business up for about four years, four or five years. And through the process, we, you know, we worked with thousands of suppliers. We, we managed a lot of products through the, the marketplace and we ended up hiring a lot of people. Uh, we hired some full time people. We hired some part time people. And then we hired a lot of freelancers to help us run the company. You know, some from the US, some from the Philippines, some from India, Pakistan. We really tried all over. And at the time we were using websites like Upwork and fiverr.com and freelancer.com and we just kept running into the same situation where we as the business owners were spending a lot of our time interviewing and trying to find the right people and then we kept running into turnover as well so we were going through this back and forth and it was leading to a lot of frustrations and so we eventually said you know let's create a better solution let's try to make a marketplace where all of the freelancers are already vetted by us and that will make it easier for the business owner. And so that's what I mainly work on today. The company is called Free Up, and it's all about helping business owners find freelancers to help them run their business. What have you guys learned about vetting people? You've done it a lot. What can you tell us about hiring the right people? Yeah, so the there's three main things that we break it down to when we're trying to vet someone to hire. Uh, the first is their skills. The second is their communication. And then the third is their attitude. So when we're looking at all this, when we go into skills, you know, this is probably the most common one that a business owner would start with. So you ask them about their experience, you put them in different scenarios and see if they actually have those skills that they claim to have. Um, so we, we kind of do testing in that area. The next one is communication, which when you're hiring people remotely, it's probably the most important factor of working with them. Because as a business owner, if you hire someone, and they, they don't communicate with you or they, they can't work on a project with you, it can be very frustrating and you'll eventually want to get rid of them. So we really look for people that communicate at a high level. You know, they're doing daily check-ins. They're able to give email updates on a daily or weekly basis. And then they're on time to meetings when, when the business owner calls them as well. And then the last one is their attitude. And for us, it's a little bit unique. Uh, we're really looking for 
individuals that are running their own freelance business, mainly full time. They tend to be the, the most uh, secure and reliable because that's how they're making all of their money. And so we really look for people that are passionate about their skill, passionate about running their freelance business and want to really help other business owners as well. Awesome. Now, when you look at business owners who want to outsource things, what are some of the common tasks that you recommend business owners get off their plates? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I was thinking about this a little bit before um, I came on the, this podcast because it's a, a little bit of a different audience for us. Um, but I was kind of going through and, and trying to figure out you know, what things may be useful for your type of audience to still take off their plate. Um, and I have a few that, that I can kind of just list off and we can kind of go into more detail if you'd like. Yeah, let's discuss them back and forth. Cool. So uh, the first one that I think could be important is bookkeeping. Um, and this kind of applies to all businesses. But for, from my experience, when you're starting a business and then even running it in the first few years, there's a lot of bookkeeping that's involved depending on your business model. And it can take a lot of your time as a business owner to handle it if you don't have someone that's there to keep everything organized and then even um, communicate that information to an accountant that you have as well. So that's, that's one I, I think that's, that could be still applicable to your audience and is really useful to have in your business. Awesome. Agree on that one. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's, you know, social media. Every business today is using social media to connect with their customers in some way. You can hire freelancers that specialize in all of the different channels, or you could get someone that just is there to manage your content calendar and make sure that you're interacting with your partners or interacting with customers and, and really putting out good content that will attract more business to you. Um, so that's another one that's, that's pretty good to have. Um, a third is a, a graphic designer. So, you know, this is someone you might not use on a regular basis, but if you have small projects here and there for your website or for other digital content that you're creating, it's great to have them in your back pocket. So you don't have to use your time trying to figure it out and creating a, a subpar product. You can tap into that person, pay them, you know, 50 bucks, have them do a quick project, and then you have a really professional looking graphic or illustration that you can use in your business. Um, so that's another. And then, you know, just to name off a few others, if you're not great at creating your own website, there's plenty of people out there that could handle that for you and then manage it as you're continuing to grow. Um, if, if you have a lot of customer service related activities, that can take up a lot of your time as a business owner and really distract you from trying to grow um, and kind of keeps you in the weeds of the business. So it can be great to have people that, that could help you there. Um, and then just having someone there for research in general. If, you know, any business is trying to do some sort of research into maybe their potential customers or a, a, a project that they're working on. So having someone like that could be a, a big help as well. So those are, you know, those are a number of, of places you could outsource. How do you find that business owners in general are resistant at times to outsourcing or getting help with certain tasks? Yeah, uh, I think every entrepreneur runs into this. And I definitely did before we, we really got into all of the outsourcing and, and seeing how much value it could add. I think one of the toughest things that entrepreneurs have to do at a certain point is let go of some tasks, let go of some things. I know for myself, I was very attached and felt a lot of ownership over the processes I had built. Um, and so it was hard to pass those off and trust someone else to do it. So I think that's a big hump that a lot of business owners have to get over when they're first thinking about outsourcing. Awesome. Now, when we talk about marketing, marketing is something that uh, architects could definitely use some help in and because sometimes it is labor intensive, especially in terms of getting more views to their site or doing activities that would bring prospective people to find their website. What mm -hmm. kind of tasks or things have you seen working for service professionals? You know, architects are different than plumbers or other industries like that. It's a very, it's a high value, high dollar kind of transaction. What would you recommend based upon what you've seen? Yeah. So first recommendation would be some local SEO. I would say that, you know, from my understanding, most architect firms are working with people within their, their, their area. Um, so if you, if you optimize your website for, you know, architecture firm in Phoenix, and you're able to pop up on the, the front page of people when they're searching for that, that's going to help you a lot to, to bring in new traffic and also bring in people that are looking specifically for that. Um, and you're offering a service that is, it matches up perfectly to it as well. Um, so, so, you know, that's one area. 
Um, another good area of, of marketing that could work really well for this type of business is putting a little bit of money into Facebook advertising. That's something that's become very popular over the past couple of years. And there's a lot of top level experts out there that know how to target people very specifically. And if you create good content about your firm, it could be a great way to get your branding out there and, and potentially even bring in some new customers. That's awesome. And I want to point that out because I was talking to an architect who's in one of our marketing coaching programs the other day. Yeah. And he was, he was playing around with Facebook because he does residential design, which is really one of the best avenue. You know, Facebook's good for that. Okay. And, um, he was putting out, he had invested in some money in some ads where the ads were kind of a direct call to action, meaning like, Hey, call me about architecture. And right. I explained to him that, you know, Facebook is really a place where people go for information. Mm. And so, like you said, if someone can, combine the SEO they're doing to the articles they're doing with Facebook yep. and just pay to have those articles shown to the right people. That's going to be a whole lot more effective. Have you found that to be true as well? Yeah, exactly. So the most effective Facebook ads we've seen for our business and then for clients through the marketplace is when the the content that you're sending them to from the ad is uh, it's it's very content focused. So it's adding value to that person while they're doing their you know, quote unquote research and it interests them. So they go and learn a little bit. And then at the bottom, you give them a small call to action. Maybe you try to grab their email address to send them uh, another piece of content, or you offer them a, a free consultation about the, the topic that you were creating the content about. So I agree with you there. It's, it's definitely most effective to lead with your content and then try to bring them into your funnel. Hopefully we've inspired some of our listeners to give that a try. If anyone does reach out to me and let me know. So Connor, you're an entrepreneur. You've, you've built several businesses. Um, it says you've also have a past building social businesses in South African and impoverished communities. Tell me about your experience growing a company. What are the phases that you see small businesses going through and some of the challenges that accompany each one of those phases? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll use free up as an example. So we're about three years old now. So the, the first nine months to a year was a lot of discovery and testing. So we knew that we wanted to offer this idea of pre-vetted freelancers, pre-vetted independent contractors to business owners, but we didn't necessarily know how it would stick or who would like it the most. So for the first year, we, we offered that as a service and we were going out and, and talking to potential customers. But then we are also offering our own e-commerce consulting services. Um, and we had a course that was how to sell on Amazon safely. So in that first year, we were really trying to feel out the market, understand what product or service they were liking the most from us. Um, and, you know, luckily it worked out that the freelance side of things was really the hit in that first year. And a lot of our, our first customers gravitated towards that. Um, but it was a lot of trial and error and really trying to understand where we could go forward with it after that first year. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a common theme with, with people who are starting their business. You, you might have an initial idea, uh, but you have to really feel out the market and, and see what is best for your customer and then make adjustments from there. Awesome. So you guys discovered a business model that worked. You found a need in the market and you developed an offering to fit that need. What was the next step for your business, the next big challenge? Yeah, the next big challenge was um, was just further building our brand. So there's a lot of marketplaces and websites out there where you can hire freelancers. Um, and for us, you know, starting up from from nothing, we, we didn't have a large community of people that we could tap into. Um, and no one knew the free up name when we were starting. So a big thing that we did in the second year was we went out to people that already had an influence in the e-commerce and online business community. And we created partnerships with them through our referral program, where we compensated them for any people that they sent over to us. We created video content with them. We created blog articles for them that further educated their community about this opportunity to hire freelancers. Um, so that was a, a big step for us. But you know, if we didn't make some of those partnerships, we may not have grown as fast as we did, and we may have run into more roadblocks. Okay. Awesome. So the partnerships worked out well for you. What else was a challenge or, or an obstacle that you had to overcome at around that time period? Mm -hmm. uh, another one was our, our software. So the, the back end of FreeUp is supported by custom software that manages all of the hours and the billing. 
And so in the first two years, it was very much in progress. So we were pulling a lot of things together. You know, we were using maybe five, six different uh, programs to pull in payments, to allow them to sign up, to do all of the actions that we needed. And we found, you know, a lot of people were frustrated by that. We definitely lost a lot of people in the process because it was just so kind of clunked together. And so that was a big challenge. And, and we really had to work through it over a couple of years. Um, and it's just recently that it's really gotten to a place where we're happy and we feel like the client's having an easy experience. So that was very much an ongoing battle for us. Yeah. Well, you guys were developing your own custom backend, right? To manage all that. Yeah, exactly. Yep. We have a, um, it's, it's myself, my business partner, and then we have a third part-time co-founder who's our, our technical guy. Okay. Do you and your partner have any technical background programming, things like that? Or is that the, the other technical founder? That's our technical founder. Um, I can I build websites using WordPress um, and then also experience with Shopify and a few other platforms. So I'm the one that built our, our customer-facing freeup.com website, but our software is left up to our technical guy. Okay. So you mentioned you give us a good list of things that architects could potentially get help with from freelance people. Uh, what other ways would you recommend that an architect or designer, someone who maybe is an intro designer, landscape architect, could use someone outside who's outsourced to be more productive? Um, yeah. So my my advice to people who are who are just getting into it or maybe doing it for the first time uh, is always to really look at the things that are on their plate, um, you know, and kind of make a list of it. So if you have ten things that you're doing on a daily basis to operate and grow your business, list those out. Um, and then think to yourself, what am I worth per hour? So if you value yourself at $100 per hour, um, and you're doing something that is much cheaper than that, then you should look to take a few of those tasks and find someone that could take those off your plate. You stay most focused on where you add the most value. And then you surround yourself with people that have those skills, have the experience, have the communication and can help you in those other areas. And what should a uh, what would you say an architect should be looking for when they go out there to say hire maybe someone who's going to be a virtual assistant or an admin assistant or a, an executive assistant? Yeah, um, so definitely, like I've been uh, honing on the communication. Make sure that when you interview them, talk to them, you feel really good about your communication and your rapport with them. You also want to find someone that has past experience, probably working within your industry. So someone that will understand things that are going on. If they're talking to customers or talking to clients, you want them to be able to hold the conversation without anything going wrong. Um, so that would probably be something to look into as well. And then the final one would just be make sure you find someone that's within your budget. Um, on all of these sites, you can usually see how much people are charging and then you can figure out you know, what works best for you and, and what will fit for your business. Great. Is there anything else you wanted to cover in today's episode, Connor? Um, I don't think so. I appreciate you having me on. I, I would love to meet anyone that's in your community, anyone that's even interested in outsourcing. I'll send you over uh, a link to my calendar so that if anyone wants to just have a chat, I I'd love to set up a time. Okay, we can do that. And where should they go to find out more about FreeUp and what you guys do? Sure. So they can visit freeup.com. That's F-R-E-E-E-U-P.com. Um, and you can also email me at connor at freeup.com. Awesome, Connor. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for a free 90 minute online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk or turning you into a slave that puts out fire after fire. Also, you can discover how to market your firm to win better projects by registering for my next free design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.